I think it's difficult not to engage with art. We don't want to think that the world is a place where there's always a right answer. Well, events in Ukraine have perhaps suggested that the Western decline is you know, perhaps uh, less precipitate than the Chinese leadership might think. Now, there is some evidence that those epigenetic changes can be inherited into the next generation. You know, when we oppose relativism, moral historicism, relativism and, uh, and uh, uh, this uh, fundamentalist objective morality, did you notice that if you take absolutely dogmatically objectivist morality, like some religious fundamentalists, it's the most distracting relativism that you actually introduce into social life. Because no argumentation counts, it's just a pure uh, conflict. Quickly, quickly, at some level then, would you agree or not, very limited level, but I think at some level a little bit of moral dogma, dogmaticism, could be helpful. What do I mean by this? Something very simple. Like, there is maybe some progress, conditionally, in this fact. I read somewhere a very good feminist point that, uh, measured by today's standards, feminist and so on, 80 to 90 percent of the sex still the 20th century would be considered rape by today's standards. So, isn't there nonetheless a uh, progress when certain things are accepted in a good sense, dogmatically? Like, I would like to live in a society like this, where you don't have to argue, you shouldn't torture people, women shouldn't be raped. If you need to argue for it, it's already, you are already losing something. This is why what horrified me is that although, uh, who did this, uh, Dick Cheney or who, and then Trump, you remember how some 10, 15 years ago when all of a sudden torture became a topic of debate. Maybe if we do it in the soft way, water, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. And even if the majority was opposed to it, this was even more horrible, it became a topic of debate. Not to mention rape, who was, I always forget his name, he's not my best friend, some American senator who claimed there is no rape. Because for rape there must be penetration, there is no penetration without the woman getting wet, which means she accepts. The moment we debate for it, we are uh, lost. Uh, just uh, uh, the last thing, uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, objective research, I still think that here, this is philosophical problematic, maybe to you and to you, we should, what horrifies me most is examples when factual truth about just what is really out there uh, serves as clearly an instrument of something we don't agree with, like racism and so on. Like an example, if I were to be a pro-neo-Nazi German, I guarantee you that I could write a book full of facts, only facts, where I say, wait a minute, it's not so simple. Look at the statistic, 60% of journalists in early 30s were, were Jews, and so on, and so on. So the true question here, when we fight anti-Semitism. It's not the question of objectivity. Are facts really like that, the way anti-Semite describes them? My point is, the moment you accept this as a topic of a debate, you sold your soul to the devil. We don't want to think that the world is a place where there's always a right answer and that we're being led by the nose to do this as opposed to that. We want the freedom to 
find meaning within a kind of constraint, a fence that the world creates for us. So we want certainty to be just here, and we want the freedom inside to find meaning. So if you think about the junctures in your life where you have to make important decisions, where you have to know stuff that's really important for how things unfold, those are cases where you have uncertainty, you have no clue how things are going to turn out, but is uncertainty really what's problematic? Imagine God or so, some omniscient being who could see the two paths of your future. In one, you move, you uproot your family, you take on this new job. In the other, you carry on as you are. Right? There are pros and cons. Right? There'll be a better school district for your kids. Um, you'll make more money. You'll lose the specific attachments. Your kids will hate you forever because they don't want to leave their friends. Right? And the truth of the matter may be, from a God's eye point of view, that, you know, it's just not true that one path is better than the other. And nor should we think, ah, they're the same. Just go ahead and flip a coin. So the uncertainty our lack of knowledge about all the details of these two alternative paths we can take, that's not the problem. The problem is the fact that the value of these two paths are qualitatively really different and neither's better than the other. Nobody comes up in the morning, wakes up in the morning, goes to the mirror and, and does the Disney villain thing like, whoa, what kind of evil can I do today? <laughs> no, they, they, they think they're doing the right thing. I mean, Putin has justifications to himself and to the world for what he's doing. And so did Hitler and so did Mussolini, etc., etc. The question, therefore, is, well, should we buy those justifications? But define the right thing, because the, I think when we say these people believe that they're doing the right thing, the right thing for whom? Because uh, ultimately, you know, and I, and I think this is what kind of you were touching yes, on as well, yes. right? It's like even in the, the multiple, multiple Western traditions around good and evil and, and their meaning, ultimately a lot of the philosophy is hidden behind the concept of universality to justify the validity of those concepts while simultaneously not applying them in a way that has been universal and so it's almost like difficult to criticize the principles if they at simultaneously claim to be universal while not actually Some sort of negating it yes yeah. but i don't think they did right? i mean so, so like i don't think of hitler as a universalist or, or Putin as a universalist. Uh, and if they think of themselves that way, they just don't understand what universalism actually is. Uh, so no, I think that if we take universalism or cosmopolitanism or, or however, whatever word you want to use seriously, then it really does follow that certain actions are not, not acceptable. And I don't see how one could reasonably use, them, uh, use those ideas as in defense of those actions. The fact that people do anyway, uh, because lots of people don't reason particularly well or they don't pay particular attention to uh, philosophy or, or facts on the ground, that's a, that's, a, that's a fact of human life. But no, I cannot honestly imagine somebody who says, I'm a cosmopolitan, therefore I'm entitled to kill half of the world because they don't look like me. That's like, that that's you, a do very you just don't understand. What? But that's Sorry. a very common cosmopolitan idea for Europe in a, in a certain period no, of time. No, it isn't. It, it is. Absolutely not. For example, so absolutely for example, no. no, I mean, it actually is. I mean, my second book was on how Josiah Royce literally introduces a notion of cosmopolitanism and idealism on the basis of enslaving a whole group of people in the early 20th century. And he had this debate even at the University of Aberdeen in their philosophical society, like trying to figure out how Anglo-Saxonism could be extended over German idealism as a justification for why Anglo-Saxons should rule yeah, the world and bring a democracy. Right, but what that is is a very good example of rationalization. Right, but you, but you have centuries and centuries of, right, but this is what I mean. So, like, you're, in our time, we're saying that this doesn't fit with what we think the rationalization would be. But then from the 18th to 19th century, you have all the letters and the, and the premier institutions of Europe that are centers of philosophy endorsing the very same argument. 
this is a this is what I mean. It's a perspective of time. It's a perspective of how context and perspective shifts. It's socially undesirable for us to make that admission now. And what we say is that that wasn't rational or philosophically rigorous. But even Nazism was thought to be a product of a certain idealist tradition. Houston Stewart Chamberlain actually defected from an Anglo-Saxon birth to support a German file tradition precisely on the basis they thought idealism was a more active sentiment of the universal and the one in the society, that it could actually create a unified notion of a folk. So we, we have to be careful with suggesting that those are all mistakes when that's a progression of the kinds of ideas, these traditions in the plurality of the West that you think exist, but somehow don't so, become but, taken up as desirable. Okay. What we do as scientists is take our best theories and look at their implications. So our best theories right now are evolution with natural selection and also quantum field theory and gravity. And these, these theories speak with a uniform voice. Space-time is not fundamental. It could not be fundamental. Those theory, so our best scientific theories themselves are telling us that space-time is not fundamental. So there's got to be a deeper story. There's something beyond space-time. And, and physicists, by the way, are finding very interesting structures, amplitudehedron, uh, cosmological polytopes. These structures actually explain the data inside space and time, but they have no notion of space and time, not even any notion of um, Hilbert spaces. So there's no quantum theory. So there, so what we're going to find is that we have to have a deeper theory beyond space and time. When we project it into space and time, it will look like evolution by natural selection. It will look like quantum field theory and, and gravity. So, so this is the, the framework in which I'm thinking about consciousness may be that deeper story. Is Putin crazy? Did, was his action in invading Ukraine crazy? In, in my view, yes. I think that someone who had until then been more or less a rational, if extremely cynical actor in his own country's national interest became at that point irrational and self-destructive. I don't think he's crazy. I don't think he goes around smearing feces on the walls of the Kremlin, but I do think that he has lost his reason and that we are now dealing with uh, somebody in a position of great power uh, whose actions cannot be reliably predicted by any calculus. And, and th th that seems to me to be a, a very important, but I, ha I have to say this, by the way, because I had previously so many times said that his actions were both predictable and rational, because the other part of the question, uh, do we fail to understand or, or not listen to what other people are saying, uh, is an absolutely valid question about the attitude of many Western countries towards Russia since the collapse of communism in 1991. Uh, we have taken a view, or rather the United States, especially since the expansion of NATO, has taken a view which, uh, which many people who are very far from being sympathetic uh, to Putin or his invasion uh, will accept uh, was provocative. The problem we have is that on the 4th of February, and many people don't yet realize this, 4th of February at the Olympics, Xi Jinping and Putin met and issued a joint statement saying that what I've just said is bullshit that there are, from now on in, three modernities. There are three at least three definitions of democracy, three definitions of human rights. They said, um, we allow our population to have a say in um, how things are, are run by us. That is our definition of democracy. And who are you to say that there is an objective one? Furthermore, they say, notwithstanding that their signatures still lie on the universal de de Convention, the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, notwithstanding the fact that they are signatories to that and that Russia was a signatory to the, to the European Convention, they say there are three definitions of human rights as well. So what is, before we even get to what we do about Ukraine, the point has been for me to frame Ukraine within that. There is a declared systemic conflict. You have no choice over that. Whether you think the West is beautiful and should, should have ruled the world forever, or whether you think it's terrible, the fact is there are now three uh, competing modernities. And you live, most of you, in the West. And you'll have to decide whether or not the thing you want to do with your life, whether it's to open a small business, study medieval history, whatever, uh, live a hedonistic lifestyle, can exist in either of the two uh, other systems. And that might put to you that it can't. And that therefore, the Ukraine conflict, which was not chosen by NATO, 
It wasn't chosen by Ukraine. It was chosen simply and purely by Vladimir Putin, who I think does have a rationality because th his, his regime has become a regime of crisis. Uh, it has moved in a fascistic totalitarian direction when previously it was a nationalist populist autocracy because there's only 20 years of the, of the fossil fuel era left. That's only 20 years left for that kind of society to exist. He has to, in order to prove to the mass base that Russians you know, are ethno-nationalistically supreme in Eurasia, he has to wipe out the Ukrainian identity. Now, I'm, I've opposed every war, You've, even the Falklands, that shocked some of my colleagues, Falklands. But I don't see any op alternative to the West standing with Ukraine. I think that we are coming closer to a tipping point at which the Chinese leadership um, may conclude that peaceful reunification is no longer an option. I don't think we're there yet, but I think that everything that the United States has done over the last two or three years has probably brought us closer to that tipping point th th than we previously were. Um, and the other thing, I mean, Chris mentioned 2035. Um, Xi Jinping uh, is a man with a sense of history and legacy. He is going to try to get a third term um, um, as Secretary General of the Communist Party at the end of this year, and he almost certainly will, will achieve it. And he may well g you know, go on and uh, go get a fourth term af after that. But you know, he's not a young man. He, he's one year younger than me. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, gerontocracy beckons. Um, you know, you know, if, he wants to, if he wants to get be the guy who goes down in history as having accomplished this, he's actually got to get moving. Um, and I don't think that a date has been set. Um, but 2035 sort of lends itself as a date because essentially China's realization of its centenary goals has, in practice, been brought forward to then. Cindy? So I agree with Nigel's analysis about the balance of calculation on one side. On the other side, though, I would say um, that COVID this year mm. has really taken up a lot of bandwidth in the Chinese government. You know, we're here, maskless, testless, um, vaccinated, and it's not the situation in China. You know, if you look at what's happened to Shanghai, that it's not going to, they're not changing their policy on zero COVID anytime soon. So that's going to take up a lot of government bandwidth. And it's also eroded a lot of the government's legitimacy, I think, in a lot of the eyes of the middle class Chinese who thought, well, we're wealthy now, we're educated. They couldn't possibly, you know, do the kind of political rights erosion they used to do. But well, you know, they just have. So I think that's taken up a lot of bandwidth and made people question legitimacy inside the party and inside the country. And also the economy as a result is tanking. You know, the Chinese economy is expected, the governmental target is 5.5% this year. It sounds like a lot, but it's the lowest in three decades and they might not even reach that. And they actually almost certainly will not reach that given zero COVID. So Given what Nigel was saying about this being a critical year for Xi Jinping's uh, continuation in power, I don't think he's going to want to rock the boat even more by you know, a, a, a dra dragged out war in Taiwan, at least not before he gets cemented in October or November, whenever the party congress is. Um, but that's not to say that that ticking clock is right. You know, he does have a historical sense of himself. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, all I can say is that on the balance of things on the other side, um, that, that will be holding him back. Wherever we turn, we see capital. Capital making gains over labor, over society, over our democracies. And here I am with an outrageous thesis that capitalism is on the way out. Now, <laughs> where am I coming from? Let's begin with capital, shall we? Now, what's capital? It's not money. It's not a kind of um, divinity. Uh, uh, it's something very tangible. Economists, and uh, I used to be an economist up until fairly recently, we define capital as you know, goods that have been produced for the purposes of assisting in the production of other goods. In other words, produced means of production. That was what capital was. Robinson Crusoe's salvaged fishing gear, in fiction, uh, a farmer's plough back in ancient times, in feudal times today, uh, a smith's furnace or hammer. These were 
are manufactured goods that help produce a larger catch of fish, more food, shiny, steely tools. This is what capital has always been. Capital, of course, preceded capitalism. Capitalism is a system, a mode of production and distribution of goods and services, uh, in which the power to compel others to do things uh, is vested in uh, those who have ownership over capital goods. In the previous mode of production, under feudalism, power sprang out of ownership of land. With the transition, the great transformation from feudalism to capitalism, increasingly power shifted from those who had land to those who owned capital goods. Capitalism vested the owners of capital with two new powers. The first power was to compel those who did not have capital to work for them. That's the whole point of being a capitalist. Your ownership of capital goods means that you have the power, the bargaining power over people who do not own capital goods, uh, who only the only capital that they, that they have to offer is their own human labor to work for you. The second power, of course, is uh, the power of the capitalist class, of those who own the majority of capital goods, to set the agenda and to set the agenda in the various fora where big, important decisions are taken on behalf of everyone. In the past, under feudalism, it was the landowners that um, had the power to set the agenda. My hypothesis, which I want to share with you and to try to explain and to convince you about, is that we now have a new form of capital. When I say now, I mean the last 10, 15 years or so. A new form of capital, I shall be arguing, is emerging. And as it does, as it, as it emerges, as it does so, it is forging a new ruling class, a spanking new ruling class, even a new mode of production. In the case of genes, we know that if you, were to, if you mutate a gene, then it will change the phenotype more importantly for an evolutionist, that change will go on to the next generation and the next and the next and the next and potentially forever. Um, whereas if you change anything else, no matter how important it may be causally in the embryology of the animal, if you break a leg, circumcise a penis, do anything else, it will not be transmitted into future generations. And that's the crucial difference. Genes are causal in the sense that a change in a gene, a mutation, has a statistical consequence in, in an indefinite number of future generations. Now, the reason that matters is that natural selection chooses between alternatives, and the choice between alternatives only matters if it is potentially immortal, or at least if it goes on for a very large number of generations. The neo-Darwinian theory, which Dennis has a lot of criticism of in his, in his book, is a theory of differential survival of genes in gene pools, and that only matters if the genes are potentially able to survive in the gene pool for a very long time. The ones that do survive are the ones that, are, that have a beneficial causal influence on everybody in which they find themselves. Successive generations, the genes find themselves in bodies again and again. The ones that su survive over many generations will be the ones that have a causal influence on a long succession of bodies. And now I'll shut up. Most of the ways I think about what we're doing in modern physics are from the perspective of thinking about ourselves as physical systems, because I'm interested in the life problem. So a lot of the paradoxes that emerge in modern physics um, can be thought about from a different perspective if we think about math itself as a physical system. So what is it for uh, physical systems to emerge that then write down laws of physics 
and describe those by mathematical statements. And from that perspective, mathematics itself looks like a kind of information. It can be copied between different things. So this is a very sort of uh, concept that I think David has talked about quite a bit. Um, that it can be copied between different physical systems. And then you can ask questions about why the concept of infinity would exist from that perspective. And I think infinity as a physical concept is not, it's a metaphor in the sense that George was talking about, that it's it doesn't describe something real physical out there. There is no such thing as a physical infinity, but infinity exists as a kind of information that we can use to manipulate matter and to understand properties of the universe as it exists here and now as sort of a counterfactual property or allowing us to see where we're missing things in our measurements or where there needs to be a new creative solution. So I think it has a kind of physicality in the sense that obviously it exists in our minds, um, but it doesn't have the kind of physicality of what it in our minds represents in the world. It's something else. And um, if we could figure out why infinity is a useful concept in terms of what it's doing when we write down laws of physics and maybe how it enables more creativity for identifying where our laws of physics are breaking down or thinking about counterfactual possibilities, then we might be able to rein in infinity and understand a little bit more about why and, and how it behaves and what it's doing. In your view, consciousness in the brain arises out of the collapse of the wave function. Can you explain that puzzling claim? What does that mean exactly? <laughs> well, there's sort of reasoning behind why I think that view, if you like, or I can say more about what the view is. I mean, the reasoning behind it had to do with the issue of, it really came from my attendance of, of a course of lectures given by a man called Steen in Oxford, sorry, in Cambridge, when I was a graduate student in Cambridge and I went to three courses of lectures which were nothing to do with the topic I was supposed to be doing, which was algebraic geometry, and I went to a course by Bondi on general relativity, which was certainly very relevant to what I did later, uh, lectures by Dirac on quantum mechanics, where I did the puzzle of the collapse of the wave function was became more evident to me. And a course on mathematical logic by a man called Steen, and his lectures made clear to me, at least what seemed to be clear to me, that conscious understanding could not be an algorithmic process. There's something different from computational processes going on. So if we believe that whatever we are, may we're sort of physical structures, then do we act according to uh, computational laws? Or is there something in the laws of physics which is outside that? And the view I maintained at that time, because of the lectures, Steen's lectures on mathematical logic and Gödel's theorem, it, it seemed clear to me that conscious understanding had to be something which was not computational. And then the question is, if it is a physical process of some sort, what could that physics be? And if I think about classical Newtonian mechanics, it didn't seem to be much chance. Uh, even general relativity, because you could put these things on computers. There is a bit of an issue about the fact that the theories depend on continuous parameters, whereas computation, as normally understood, is a discrete process. And the way we do calculations in physics to mirror what's going on in the world, put them on computers, uh, we regard these as approximations which you could refine as much as you like. And they're still then computational processes. There's a little bit of a problem there about whether there might be a distinct difference in continuous evolution from discrete processes. But I didn't think that was the answer. It seemed to me that there had to be physical processes which were not computational. And uh, the view is that this is conscious understanding has to be one of these. And where in physics do we see anything not computational or anything of relevance that would be not computational? And uh, 
it seemed to me it had to be the collapse of the wave function. I can only guess what Michio was referring to when he was talking about the gravitational waves in uh, the early universe. I suppose it was the B modes in the CMB, is that right? No. No? I'm talking what? about a future generation of space-based gravity wave detectors like LISA, Laser Interferometry Space Antenna, being pushed by the European Space Agency <coughs> and NASA. Yeah, but what's the signal? Primordial gravitational waves. That's right. Gravitational okay. waves before 300,000 years after the Big Bang, at the instant of creation itself. Yeah, um, right. So, so why would this be evidence for the multiverse? I suppose because you say it would be evidence for a particular type of inflation. Is that uh, the idea? No, because once you have data from a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, you can run the videotape backwards and see what alternate universes a trillionth of a second before the Big Bang match the data a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang. And so in other words, in this sense, we can actually get data from before creation itself, from before t is equal to zero by extrapolating post Big Bang radiation to the pre Big Bang era. And then of course, string theory gives you a number of predictions about the pre Big Bang universe. That's what string theory does. It gives you finite results for everything. And so you can actually calculate the pre-Big Bang radiation and compare it with the post-Big Bang radiation of gravity, uh, space-based gravity wave detectors. Yeah, but what's it got to do with the multiverse? Because this allows you to extract out the key universe that set the whole, sets everything in motion, and then you know which of the multiverse ideas is the correct one. Just like Newton's laws. Newton's laws has an infinite number of solutions for baseballs, rocket ships, or marbles, an infinite number of solutions. Which one is the correct one? It depends on your initial conditions. We do not know the initial conditions of the Big Bang itself. Once we have the initial conditions of the Big Bang, then you can start to rule out uh, universes that, are, that don't match. And out of the multiverse, you can, you can get the birth of our universe itself. So starting with the multiverse theory, you then get the theory of the universe itself by running the videotape backwards. Well, but obviously, just to describe our own universe, we don't need all the other infinitely many universes. So, um, no, but this would help to rule out all the other universes that are do, do not correspond to the experiment. Maybe, maybe let me ste step back a little bit. Um, so I'm not saying that um, all those other universes do not exist. I'm trying to say that science can't tell us anything about whether they exist or do not exist. It's just not in the realm of science. I don't have a big problem when people talk about multiverses of whatever type, if that may be the many words interpretation or eternal inflation or the string theory landscape and so on. I get a problem if they say it's, it's science because it isn't. It's a weird kind of Platonism uh, where scientists come to believe in the existence of mathematics. Well, as I said, every year, as more data comes in from Fermilab, from CERN, every year we'll have better and better data, which will allow us to zero in on this theory without having to build an accelerator the size of the Milky Way galaxy. I started working for the government as a drugs advisor in 1994 when we had a few deaths from MDMA. And that committee was actually quite an effective committee because we basically recommended f free water in all venues, which still happens today. The fact you can always get tap water in pubs or restaurants was part of the process that we put through to reduce the harms of MDMA. And we also recommended chill out rooms. And that was an amazing public harm uh, message because virtually no deaths from MDMA in the, in the subsequent uh, 20, 30 years, except when people tried to stop it and uh, various novel forms such as PMA which are, have come along. But MDMA itself, you can deal with the harms of MDMA sensibly by allowing people to get it in a situation where they can be protected. And as a result of that, 
I was asked to adv advise several government committees on how we should deal with uh, other drugs. And I was full of enthusiasm. You know, there was a rational response to MDMA. So let's, I assume there'd be a rational response to other drugs. But I, when I started looking at it, I realized that actually the drugs which had already been made illegal, you could not have a rational discussion about. And why is that? That is because if you try to change the, the legal status of a drug that is illegal, the newspapers, the right wing press go, in, go insane. So, and of course, the most classic example of that was when um, we were eventually allowed to seriously discuss the legal status of cannabis. Cannabis until uh, 2004, some forms of cannabis were class A alongside crystal meth and crack cocaine, and some forms of cannabis were class B. And after quite a detailed assessment, the advisory council, which I was on at the time, said they should all be class C. And the newspapers went insane. And they, they desperately tried to stop that happening. But that, um, Blunkett was a Home Secretary at the time, and he, he pushed that through because he realized that that was what the science said. But subsequently, the, the media backlash terrified Blair and then Brown and subsequently Cameron and uh, May. And since then, gov governments have always been absolutely terrified of loosening, or I would say being more rational, about the classification of any drug. And eventually cannabis got regraded, and that's how I got sacked for proposing that. And subsequently now, we've been pushing more and more drugs into the legal category. In fact, under Theresa May, we brought in this completely bizarre piece of legislation which says anything apart from alcohol that affects your brain is actually illegal, even if, even if it's never been invented. So, so it's, the drugs, drug laws, are, they, have, they have two roles. They, they fulfill the need of many aspects of the media to, to, to find someone to hate and something to hate and get banned. And then they s serve a kind of political purpose that politicians can pretend they're doing something. They can make a law even though the law actually is probably going to do more harm than good. I think when stand-up works, um, and people, most people here will have been in, in gigs that work brilliantly, maybe even here, and felt it's almost a holy experience at times. You feel you're all part of a single moment. It can feel like a religious experience because you're all together. And when a comedian dies, it's very interesting because it's like the air thins. And, um, you know, we all die, especially at the beginning of our careers. And I was once paid £20 to leave the stage in Edinburgh Festival. Um, so it was going so badly. Um, but actually, they're very important when you're learning those experiences, or what you have to tell yourself. Um, when uh, they are very important because you're finding out who you are and you have to be truly vulnerable in stand-up and I think that the, t the times that stand-up's disappointing is where they're not reaching out in that way they're not giving you enough vulnerability and it feels weird in some ways to say that you have to be vulnerable as a stand-up it seems like a very powerful thing but actually it's a, a delicate line uh, that you have to tread you have to offer enough of yourself so that a similar thing the, the comedian may be very different from you as a member of the audience they may be talking about something that you have no experience of but you will find that that point at which you feel truly connected to it um, what I find very interesting is when people like Robin Ince who are comedians and also become very immersed in the world of science make shows where science and crea creativity meet um, because my father was a, a chemist he was a very scientific man and um, he he didn't really like blurred lines he didn't like it necessarily when things were uncertain or um so yeah I, I find it very interesting when when any kind of creativity and science meets and 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 what what that brings about because on paper it should clash in some ways but i think it could be quite an interesting mix well paul you do that in all your work you're using heat like in one thousand things worth knowing and you have references to science and so if i bring you on in on this is that quite important to you to be able to glean from many disciplines well it is absolutely and in fact i think maybe at this point i might begin to migrate a little bit <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> over to to another way of thinking about things and i touched upon it briefly when i mentioned joyce's obsession with this factoid I mean, who cares? Who cares at the end of the day? Well, he cared. And he, what, why did he care? Because at some level, I think he realized that one does have to test art against some notion 
of reality. Now I use the term notion of reality because we know reality is, at least I think we know, reality is itself a construct. On the other hand, we have in our everyday discourse, um, it's a term we understand. Um, now Joyce did not care so much about the fact that a major component of the plot of Ulysses um, ha has to do with the, a foot and mouth uh, pandemic, right, in 1904. And he didn't really care that that actually happened in 1912. He was willing to overlook that fact in terms of some other motive. But let's, but, but I think we are constantly testing the psychological verifiability, say, not only the physical verifiability of whether or not one can go down this particular street and actually if you turn right, you're in this other street. That's one test. The psychological verifiability, is this likely to be how a man might respond to the notion that someone has been, as he comes home at night and comes down into the area over the railings in Seven Eccles Street, uh, uh, Leopold Bloom's home, what is he going to make, if anything, of the fact that his wife may have been with another man?